Jesus, our affection, our devotion, pour out on the feet of Jesus, our affection, our devotion, pour out on the feet of Jesus, our affection, our devotion, pour out on the feet of Jesus, we love you, oh how we love you, you are the honor, our hearts adore, sing Jesus we love you, oh how we love you, you are Jesus, we love you. Oh, how we love you. You are the one hearts adore. But you know, last week we talked about you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Thank you, darling. He that finds so wise finds a good thing. Amen. And uh, today we're going to talk about God is a restorer. He restores all things. You know, there's not a person in here at some point in time in our life we have not suffered loss. You may have lost a friendship. You may have lost a, a, a child. You may have lost... Uh, you know, there are people that lose their marriage. There's all kinds of things that happen to us over the course of our life. But God is a restorer. And uh, he, he makes a promise to us. His promise is that He will restore. And that's found in the Old and the New Testament. In fact, it's found in two places that I know of in the Old Testament. It's found in the New Testament. In the third chapter of the book of Acts, P Peter begins to declare to those Jews that are present, the, the, the saving grace of God, how that, that Jesus came and how that he redeemed them. And he talks about the times of refreshing. David said in Psalms 23, uh, in verse 3, he said, uh, He restoreth my soul. You know, that's Psalms 23 is probably the most uh, uh, remembered uh, verse in the whole Bible other than Jesus wept. And uh, it is that David said, He restores my soul. Now David prophesied that, the restoration of our heart and life, long before Jesus went to the cross. But he went to the cross to redeem all of us. You know, I think it was the high priest that said, Shouldn't one man die for the whole nation? Well, Jesus died not only for the nation of Israel, but he died for the whole world. And we live in exciting times. I tell you, th this is the time before the Lord is going to come. But God is a God that restores. And it's never too late for God to restore things to you. You know, we, we told you a couple of weeks ago that uh, in Israel they have received the red heifer. I said, well, what's that got to do with anything? They needed the red heifer to purify 
uh, before they build their temple. So they get ready to build a temple. Everything God has said has come, come to pass. We're going to read some verses of Scripture uh, out of the message uh, translation out of Deuteronomy 30, uh, chapter 30, verses 3 through 15, uh, 13. And uh, we have seen this uh, in our lifetime. Uh, this has come to pass. In 1948, Israel became a nation again. But you know, the promise that God made to the descendants of Abraham belongs to us because we've been adopted into his family. So everything God has promised, he's promised to us. In Deuteronomy 30, beginning at verse 3, God, your God, will restore everything you've lost. You know, God will restore to you that that is lost. He will have compassion on you. He will come back and pick up the pieces of, from all the places where you were scattered. You know, we the Jews were scattered and, and some of them still remain all over the world. No matter how far away you end up, God, your God, will get you out of there and bring you back to the land your ancestors once possessed. 1948, that became a, a, a fulfillment. The Deuteronomy 30 became a fulfillment. God fulfilled the promise that wherever they were scattered throughout the earth, God brought them back. He will give you a good life and make you more numerous than you. You know, God wants to give you a good life. Amen. And we say, well, because we live in the United States of America, we have a good life. God will give you a good life anywhere, anywhere you live. A number of years ago, uh, Kenneth Hagin Jr. was preaching in, in Africa, probably 30 years ago, and he preached that God will meet your needs. And, you know, he, he said, you know, God can help you to, you know, they lived in huts. He, he can have you, help you have a tin roof, and you can have a bed to sleep on. You have to sleep on the floor, and you... You can have a bicycle. And he came back to that area about a year or two years later. And one, one of the, the people said, I want to show you my house. He said, I have the only one in the village. He said, I have a tin roof on my hut. He said, I have a, a nice cot to sleep on. And he said, I have a bicycle. Now, that don't sound like a whole lot to us. But uh, because, you know, in America, you know, we have everything. But in, in Africa, that they, they don't have a lot. And so it was a lot. And, and uh, he asked him, how, how did you? He said, you know, we just, we just raise enough crop to provide for ourselves. But she said, you know, I got the idea to raise more. And, I, and he said, I sold all those crops. And, and little by little, I bought all this stuff. You know, God will increase you. He's the God of increase. God, your God will Put all these curses on your enemies who hated you and were you uh, get uh, were out to get you and will make a new start. Listen, obey to God, keep all his commandments that I've commanded you this day. God, your God, will outdo himself in making things go well for you. You know, God will outdo himself. You know, there are things that we say, well, we don't deserve that. Well, it, it's nothing to do with deserve. It's because God is God and he's outdoing himself. Because God is God and, and he does exceedingly abundantly above all we can think or ask. Hallelujah. God will outdo himself in making things go well for you. You'll have babies and calves and grow crops and enjoy and all around good life. Yes, God will start enjoying you. You know, when God blesses us, we, we get the enjoyment out of the things that we have, but you know, God enjoys blessing us. There's not a, a parent that enjoys uh, their blessing their children. You know, uh, Hunter and Angel have a little one, a little lyric, and uh, you know, there, there's nothing that they want to do other than bless their children. They want to bless their children. They want to have a better life. All of us have a better life than our parents did. And uh, that's because of God's blessings. And uh, it goes on to say, if you will listen and obey God, your God, keep the commandments and regulations written in the book, nothing, half-hearted, you must return to God, your, your God, totally, heart, soul, heart and soul, holding nothing back. This commandment I am commanding you today isn't too much for you. And it's not out of your reach. You know, it's not out of our reach to please God. You know, 
the, the Bible says every good and every perfect gift come from above. God is so good to us. Now, you know, any prophecy, whether it's this written word or, or any other prophecy that we receive, you know, sometimes people say, well, God told me something. Well, if you can't back that up with Scripture, throw it away. Because everything that God says is backed up by His Word. Everything. You know, I've had people tell me stuff from years ago, and, and I thought, well, you know, God doesn't do that. I had a guy years ago, uh, he, he had an old, somebody gave him an old burn-up truck. And I mean, that truck was a piece of junk. He said, God gave it to me. I thought, God didn't give you that truck. It's burned up. God doesn't do that. God gives you good things. Amen? God is a good God. You know, uh, years ago, there was a missionary, and they lived, I think, in China or somewhere overseas. And uh, when they got ready to come home, his daughter didn't want to come. She said, I don't want to go there. Why not? She said, well, at Christmas time, they always send the toys, and they're broken, and she said, I want to go to that place where things are broken and things are not good. This, we have a good life here. And, uh, you know, of course, they had to explain that, you know, a lot of times people just give their junk. You know, that happens here occasionally. People bring the junk that they have. They think the, the church is a good place to deposit your junk. And uh, we, we let it sit around a week or two, and then we get rid of it. But anyway. Well, in uh, Matthew 18, 16, it says, But if he will not hear, then take with the two or more that in the mouth of two or three witnesses let everything be established. In 2 Corinthians 13 and 1, it says, This is the third time I'm coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word will be established. In other words, when we, we receive a word from God, if we can't find any reference to it in the Bible, you've got to you got to let that go. You know, that guy should have took that truck to the junkyard and, and got what he uh, could for the piece of junk. That's all it was. God's promise to restore is found in the Old and New Testament. And, and when God makes a promise, he keeps it. In, uh, in, in the book of uh, Acts, I'll skip ahead. In Acts, the 19th chapter, uh, verses... Uh, Acts, the third chapter, verse 19 through 20. Have y'all turned to the wrong place? Now, brother, I would not that through ignorance you did it, as though uh, also did your rulers. But those things which God before has shown by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer, and he, he has so fulfilled. Repent you, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. When the times of refreshing come from the presence of the Lord... And he shall send Jesus, which before was preached unto you, whom the heavens must receive until the time of the rest restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his prophets since the world began. You know, it is that God is a God of restoration. He will restore the things that we lost. And you know, there, there are people who have had all kinds of losses, but God has promised to restore now, you know, uh, there, there are those that you have uh, suffered the loss of a child or maybe you, you suffer, suffer the loss of a, a, a job or maybe you had a, a close friend and, and that friendship just broke apart. You know, when our life changes, it separates us from people. And, uh, you know, you may have been the one that had a friendship, but that friendship is severed because you received Jesus Christ. Well, God wants you to live the abundant life. God wants you... He wants to bless you. You, you represent Him. He wants, he wants you to do well in life. He, he wants to bless you. God is a blesser. Uh, every good and every perfect gift come from above. God wants to bless you. He wants you. And if loss has robbed you of your joy, and there's a lot of people that have lost their joy because of loss in their life. And, and, and it becomes uh, uh, something we drag behind us. You know, uh, Brother Jesse's, uh, talked about one time that, that people drag uh, doubt and unbelief. Well, you know, you can drag a, last, a lack of joy. The, the Bible says the joy of the Lord is our strength. The Lord is the strength of our life. God empowers us. 
You know, in everything we face in life, the Lord faces it with us. We don't face it alone, but God faces us with us. And so if loss has robbed us, then we, we need to, we ask God to forgive us of, uh, of, of holding on and losing our joy. That, that uh, you know, when you think, speak, and act, you know, as a man believeth in his heart, so is it. That's in the book of Proverbs. You know, when you begin to think negatively, and you think about the, the loss, and you can drag that loss behind, and you say, well, my life would have been better if I hadn't lost that job, or my well, life would have been better if uh, my husband or wife uh, had not died. Well, there's a lot of things that can happen in life, but God is a store. And I want to make one thing very uh, certain to you, very important to you, that God does not bring the original back. You know, in the book of Exodus, I believe it's the 22nd chapter of the book of Exodus, God talks about, you know, that if you kill an oxen or you kill a sheep or maybe you sell one by accident, then uh, you come before the judges. But he says, if you kill a sheep or an oxen, you, you don't just give them an oxen or you give them a sheep. You restore four times, four times. Uh, what was lost. You know, that, that is it. That's the heart of God. God wants to restore you. What you have lost, God will restore. Now, he doesn't give you back the original. You know, in the book of Job, uh, it begins with the fact that Job lost his children. I think he had 10 kids. He, he had six daughters and four sons, and, and he lost them all. And uh, he, he you know, goes through all the tribulations for about nine months then God restores him. God brings restoration in And he has 10 other children in old age, and God increased him twice. He had twice as much. He was the richest man in the East. Now he's doubly the richest man in the East. He has, he has sheep, all these animals, plus he has new children. Now God didn't resur resurrect the old ones, you know, give him his children back. Those were gone. But God brought joy into his life because he had a new, new, new children. He, he increased in his old age. And it says that it was in his old age because it's unusual for people to have uh, children in an old age. You know, my wife and I, we love our grandchildren. They wore us out. But, you know, we're not equipped to have any children, not at our age. We don't want any children. Children are for young people. You know, like like Hunter and Angel, they 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 are they're they're having kids. Wonderful. We love your children. Have 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 a, a dozen of them. <laughs> but I don't want any. Why? Because you know when you get older, you don't move as fast. My wife told me the other day, you got an old man's gait. I said, what? slap you and make you think God did <laughs> You know, when we get older, but Job was an, an older man and his wife was older and she had 10 kids. My mother had six. Six children. They're four boys and two girls. But can you imagine having 20? God had to restore her in health. Amen. And uh, so, so Job had, had these ten. God restored double. You know, you have to believe God for God's abundance to come. If you don't believe God, God will not make it happen for you. And, you know, it, it is, a lot of things will happen for us, but we have to believe that God will do it. We have to believe that God will restore what's lost. That God, God loves us enough to increase us, amen, and to bless us so that we have more because he's El Shaddai. He's the God that's more than enough. And when God blesses, he doesn't just, you know, you, you, you lost your job, I'll give you another. He'll give you a better job. I remember one time the, the guy came up to Brother R.W. Shamrock and he said, I just want a job. And he laid hands on him. He said, Lord, give him a shoe shine. Oh, 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 wait a minute. He said, I've been to college. I don't want a shoe shine. Well, he said, you didn't ask. What do you want? He said, well, I'm trained as an engineer. Well, that's a, a difference between a, somebody shines somebody's shoes 
and somebody that's went to college and has a degree in engineering. You know, shoe shines, they, they work for tips and, and, uh, and not many shoe shine places left. You know, more, normally when you, uh, you see them in the airport, very few of those because it doesn't pay well. But an engineer has to make more. And, and so he prayed for him, Lord, give him an engineering job. God bless you, you know his talents, you know his ability. Well, God is God, and he will uh, cause increase to come. And so he found a better job, amen? And because God hears and answers prayer. And uh, you know it is that, that you just look back to the things that God wants to do for you. You know, God will restore you. You know, under the law, they will restore three, four, five times what you lost. But we have a better covenant. No, that's under the old covenant. That's under the law. Aren't you glad you don't live under the law? Amen. Under, under, we live under grace and mercy. Woo, I'm glad God is full of grace and mercy. And as the Bible says, His mercy endures forever. Now, you know, some of us have sinned since we've been saved. I know I have. And you have to go to God and say, Lord, I, I've sinned against you. Forgive me. And God said, well, I'll think about it. No, He always... 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know, in the Old Testament, they, they had to bring an offering. And, 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 and the sin they brought, it required different offerings. And if you were very extremely poor, you know, they, they had the, the poor people would offer this. But there was, uh, uh, there was a lamb that was shed for the whole nation every year. God did away with that. God said, well, lambs are great. That only pays the interest on, on, the, on the note that's owed. But without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And God poured his wrath out on the Lord Jesus Christ. And, you know, uh, he was humiliated. You know, my, my grandmother used to have a uh, Jesus on the cross. It had, had a little cloth. Well, that ain't how they hung Jesus up. They stripped Jesus of all his clothes and hung him out for the world to see. And uh, they, somebody found the sign uh, that, that said, he's the king of the Jews. They found that sign in, 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 in way down in the trash. They found that sign. And uh, it was written that he's the king of the Jews. And it's written in three different languages. That people that spoke Greek could read, he's the king of the Jews. Well, it was meant to be a humiliation to humiliate the nation of Israel that we have crucified their king. We're in charge. But God was doing something greater uh, because when Jesus died, that wasn't the end of the story. When, when Jesus died, he ascended into the, uh, the bowels of the earth. And on the third day, the Holy Spirit came in. See, you used to receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. The Holy Spirit came and helped <clears throat> Jesus to be resurrected from the dead. And it wasn't a light thing. God, the Bible says, he used all his mighty power to redeem the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because the devil and demons did not want Jesus raised from the dead. Because they knew when he was raised from the dead, that was the end. It's over. That what God prophesied to Eve in the garden had come to pass. And so they did everything they could to hold Jesus in the grave, but he came out victorious with the keys of death, hell, and the grave. That's what Jesus did for us. He overcome the forces of darkness. You know, you don't stand a chance against the forces of darkness, but thank God the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus carries authority in heaven and earth and the earth. And when we declare the name of Jesus, the devil knows Jesus. You know, the seven sons of Sceva one time, they, they thought, well, you know, they saw Paul casting out demons uh, by the name of Jesus. They said, you know, that's a good way to make money. And so they found one that was demon-possessed, and they said, you know, we adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. He said, well, I know who Paul is, and I certainly know who Jesus is, but I don't think we've been introduced. And uh, this demon-possessed man beat these seven men up, and they ran. Some of them lost their clothes. I mean, he tore them up. You're no match for the devil, but thank God through the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, the name of Jesus, uh, carries authority in heaven and earth and under the earth. There's no place that the name of Jesus doesn't carry power. 
when God restores you, he restores. First of all, David said he restores my soul. The first thing God did for us is to restore us into his kingdom. We've been taken out of the kingdom of darkness. You know, we were all, we were all headed in that direction. The whole world was lost. The world was lost. God, God dealt with, with Noah. He tried to win the world, and the world wouldn't listen to him. And eight souls were saved. I saw a documentary way out in the middle of the Azores. There, there was a, on a volcano, there, there was a, 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 a statue. They don't know where it came from. People came to that island and, and took that thing down in pieces and moved it. They don't know where it is, but it was a statue. Well, that, all that does is show that there was a universal flood, that, that people had built that statue up on the mountain years and years and years and years ago, but God sent the flood and wiped it all out. You know, when the children of Israel crossed the Red Sea, they, they crossed. Now, the Red Sea is thousands of feet deep in places. But where they cross, the, the mountains come together. When the flood of Noah uh, subsided and all that water, all that sand ran, and, and they had about a, they had a ramp. And they, they walked across. God made it like dry ground. The, the walls... The water was congealed, frozen in place. And they marched across. Well, you know, Pharaoh and his army thought, well, we'll do the same thing. And they, they, by, by the time the whole army got in, the waters came back together. They were, they were underwater. They were destroyed because they couldn't do what God did. They did it because of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit went before them. Now, you know, the, the, if you look at the way that the uh, children of Israel was laid out in their camp, it forms a cross. It all points to the cross. It all points to the fact that Jesus had shed his blood so that men could be saved. They, they brought the blood of bulls and goats, and, and they sacrificed that before God. And uh, that, just, that just paid the answer. God said, I'll accept that because there's one coming that I'm going to accept his blood for the whole world. And there's people today living on the other side of the world. You'll never meet. You don't know their name. You don't know anything about their life. Jesus died for them. Jesus died for every person in Africa. He died for every person in Russia. He died for every person in India. He died for every person in China. He died for every person in Japan. Every person that, that's in, in the Philippines. Every person everywhere for all time. The blood of Jesus Christ has covered our sins. He restores my soul. David said he prophesied that before it came to pass. You know, we read uh, Acts 3.19, Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. You know, we've experienced those refreshing. It says in one version, Until everything that is lost shall be restored. Have you lost anything? You know, over, over time, we've lost it a lot. You know, God has restored and restored and restored. Sometimes God restores, and we don't even recognize that God has restored. God restores. He, he, he doesn't say, well, you know, I restored that to you. You know, he, he is gracious. In the Greek, it reads, everything that can be restored shall be, and then the Lord will return. We live in a time, we live in exciting times. We live in a time of the restoration of the Lord that God restored. And, you know, one of the things that God is doing in this last day is he's, he's restoring souls. He's, people are being born again by the power of the Almighty God and is restoring all things. You know, I, over the years I've had lots of jobs. I, you know, I had a lot, some were good and some were not that good. But, you know, God has blessed me. But, you know, I was called to be a preacher. My, my grandfather was pastor, pastored for 55 years. My dad uh, pastored and taught Sunday school. And, uh, you know, at an early age, when I went to college, I, I thought, well, I don't want to be a preacher. And so I, I thought I, I would be an airplane pilot. And I, and, and I, I had potential. You know, I studied 
And uh, I, I was making good grades. And I could maybe flown for the airline or pipeline or something. But you know, that wouldn't have been God's best for me. This, this is the best vocation I've ever had, to be able to proclaim the Word of God and, and see the things that God has done. You know, next year I'll be, uh, have pastored this church for 40 years. In 40 years, I've seen a lot of people come through the church. We used to be up uh, in the other church, and, and I've seen a lot of things that happen. I've seen people that they should have remained, they left. They left, they had reasons to leave, they left. Well, that's okay if they leave, but you know, you got to have permission from God to go anywhere. You know, God sets you in a place, and you know, he, he expects you to stay there until he says go. We had a missionary, I, I saw him uh, a couple of months ago, about a month ago, missionary in Africa. And uh, they were in, in uh, the uh, war when the war in Rwanda was taking place. And they had a church of about 1,200. They, they were doing good. And uh, it, it got down to they had 100. Everybody had left. And people had been killed. And so one of his elders came to him and said, Pastor, when are you leaving? The Red Cross, the French Red Cross left yesterday. When are you leaving? He said, when God tells me. And God hadn't told me. God said, stay, stay put. You know, it is that sometimes we get moved by our emotions and we make mistakes. But he was listening to God. You know, uh, Isaac was the son of Abraham. He's the son of promise. Isaac had other sons. But he's the son of promise. And God promised rested with him. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We say that all the time. Well, Isaac was in the land and there was a famine in the land. And so everybody's headed down to Egypt because Egypt always had food. And so he's making provision. He's going to Egypt like, you know, common sense, you should go to Egypt. But God said, remain in the land, plant your seed here, and I'll bless you. Well, you know, he had to have faith in God to do that. Because common sense says you better go down to Egypt. And probably, you know, Abraham had 218 warriors. He had a lot of people working for him. You know, there's probably some of them say, man, we stay here, we're going to starve to death. What's wrong with this guy? But he's trusting God and he has them plow and plant. But God gives them a hundredfold return. You know, people have been chasing that hundredfold return. Well, you know, God, in some respects, God has given us over a hundredfold return. God is a God of increase. He's El Shaddai. He said, I am the God that's more than enough. He, <clears throat> that word means the supreme breasted one. In other words, anything you need, I can supply. Now, I'm going I'm to close because I'm going to receive communion. In the 15th chapter of the book of Luke, we find the story of of, uh, of Peter and the great catch of fish. And uh, in verse 1 it says, And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake of God. That's talking about Jesus. And he saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them, and they were washing their nets. And they entered, he entered in one of the ships, which was Simon's, who became Peter, and prayed or asked him that he would thrust out a little from the land. He sat down and taught the people out of the ship. And now when he had left speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let your nets plure down for a catch, for a draw. Now, we get the picture here. Jesus is standing by the seashore. He sees these two boats. He steps into one of them. He said, and uh, you know, they're, they're washing their nets and they're mending their nets. Because we find out that, that Peter had been out all night. They fished at night. We've been, we've been on the uh, Sea of Galilee, and it's, it's clear water. And, and they, catch, they don't catch fish way out. They catch them near the shore, and you can see the bottom. And so they fish at night, so the fish don't see them. 
And, and he, he explains, he said, Lord, I, I, we, we've been out all night. I, you know, he's thinking, I need to go home and get some rest because i gotta, I got to come out tomorrow night. And, you know, they live from day to day. They, 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 you know, they're not like us. They didn't have a bank account. They lived from day to day. And so if they didn't catch anything, there wasn't any money coming in. I don't know if you've been in that situation, but I have been before where there no money coming in. We had a little bank account. We had a credit card. Our, we did Christmas for our kids, and we thought it was the worst Christmas. They had the happiest time. Our kids thought it was great. We didn't. My wife and I, oh, man, this is... So the next year, we went overboard, but that's another story. And so Peter, you know, he's being gracious. And, and so he says, well, okay, we'll, we'll launch out. And so he paddles out a little way. Now, Jesus said, let the nets down. But Peter doesn't want to have to wash those nets. He said, I've been fishing all night. I need a nap. You know, there's a lot of reasons. So he let this old net down. But all of a sudden, the net's full of fish because God is who he is and Jesus is who he is. And he had already planned to repay Peter for the use of his boat and for the time that he'd invested. We don't know how long Jesus talked, maybe an hour or two hours. And when he had finished, he said, let's go out. Peter's like, man, I really need a nap now. But... Jesus has this multitude of fish. He beckons for the others to say, hey, you need to come help us. The net's breaking. Because they had a net-breaking boat sink. The boats are about to sink. Well, Jesus is doing what they should have done under the law. He's repaying him for the use of his property. And when God does it, he does it big time. And they had this big catch of fish. You know, later, after Jesus' resurrection, he calls out, Hey, children, you got anything? You got it caught anything? No, that caught a thing. Well, let your nets down. Peter says, There's only one God fishes like that. That's Jesus. And he, he swims to shore. And they caught, I think it's 50 some odd fish. God is a God of abundance, and he wants to restore. But, you know, you have to ask God. Now, in the Old Testament, they would come before the judges. You know, Jethro told Moses one day, he said, man, you're wearing yourself out. And you're doing a disservice to these people. You're going to have to appoint judges over simple things. The hard things you can, you can judge, but the simple things, you need to leave it to these other people. And so they would come. And uh, they would say, that belongs to me. What was left? That belongs to me. He killed my oxen. He killed my. He sold my sheep. And in the Bible it says they would stand before these men, but actually they're standing before God. In the Greek it says Elohim. That's the name of God. That's Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. That is mine. That is mine. If you want God to restore something, you need to say, that is mine. And the devil has taken it from me. I've lost it. Lord, you promised to restore. That's what they did. They said restore. And so they would judge and say, well, yeah, this is. You owe him five sheep. You owe him five oxen, four oxen. You, you got to repay your neighbor. It is that God is more than willing to repay us. He's, he's such a good God. His, the Bible says His mercy endures forever because there was none of us who'd make it to heaven. None of us. No, well, you could stand with your nose in the corner to the day you died and you'd still be lost because of the sin you had in your life. You were born under the curse of sin. But God has forgiven you. He's forgiven you of all your sins. You know, it is sometimes we, we, we know that we've sinned. We know, well, we did something wrong. But you know, there's a lot of times that we do things wrong, we don't even think about it. But God forgives us of all of that stuff too. He, 
He is willing to forgive us. He is the God that loves us. He wants to restore us. It starts with our, our inner man. He wants to restore you. And he wants you to have a good life. You represent him. God wants you to have such a good life in this world that people that aren't saved will say, man, you lost that? And look what you got. God has blessed you. You, you, need, you need to ask God to restore things. Now, if you don't believe God, you don't ask, you, don't, you won't have it. Years ago, long before my wife and I were married, I went to Holly Ridge. And if you don't know where Holly Ridge is, you've got to have a map to find it. And, and, and the pastor there had a surgery, and so I was filling in. And the first or second time I went, I went over to this fellow's house and sat down. They just, you know, they had vegetables and fried chicken. And he said, let me tell you, son, if you see it, you can eat it. If you don't see it, don't ask because we don't have it. But, you know, God has an abundance. And, and sometimes, you know, when we ask God, it's not an immediate takes time. You know, it takes time to restore 10 children uh, to, to, to Job, but God did it. It takes time. Some things that we ask God for, it takes time because God is looking for a better situation. I need a better job. Oh, God, I lost my job. You know, I've seen advertising on, people, uh, pe- uh, on TV where people have said, well, I lost my, my job, but thank goodness for good Rx. But I don't know how good RX, but you know what? God will find you another job. And God will find you a better job. Because he's a God that he is El Shaddai. He's more than enough. God doesn't want you to give you the same job. Like the man said, oh, you want a shoe shine? No, 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 I don't want that. I, I, I've been to college. I'm educated. I want a better job. God will give you a better job. But, you know, in the meantime, you know, we believe God for those things. We believe God for better. You know, one of the reasons we believe God for better is so we have enough to give into the kingdom of God that we can do for others. You know, there, there are people that never heard the gospel one time. And, and we can send them a Bible. Or we send a missionary. And we empower people. People, You know, I, I ran into a missionary the other night. I know I'm a little, going a little long. We're going to receive communion in a minute. And uh, he, he was in Brazil. And... Uh, he, he went up and down those rivers, and uh, there were headhunters there. He'd been in villages. He had the far side, you know, put a gun to his head. All kinds of things happened. And, and he went to Peru. Now, you think, well, Peru is a better place. No, it's worse. Because he told me there are people that get off the airplanes from all over the world, and they come to sacrifice to other gods. And he said, I, I thought when I came to Peru, it would be better it's worse. But you know, God is God. He's more than enough. And he's equipped that missionary to stand in the gap. You know, along the Brazilian river, that, that river that runs between Brazil and this other country, he probably thought, man, this is bad. I'm eating headhunger. I, I had the, 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 the Farsi put a gun to my head. I, I've had my family threatened. I've had all these things. You know what? That was preparation. Preparation for the things that he's facing now because he's been tested in battle. You know, it was that, that uh, uh, when Joseph went to the prison house, he thought, man, I thought I, I, I was going to, you know, step up in life. You know, God gave me a prophecy, and man, it don't seem like it's coming to pass. God was preparing him because in prison you find the people that tell the truth and tell a lie. And you learn how to tell people who are telling the truth and telling a lie because God's fixing to put him in a different position. He's going to be the, he's going to be the prime minister of Egypt. And he's going to have to know when people are just giving a lie and people are telling the truth. He needs to know. He needs to be able to discern. And, and you know, he didn't have the Holy Spirit like we have it today. The Spirit of God is promoting him, but he needs to know. You know, there's a lot of things that we need to know. That's the reason we need to get our, our, our nose in the book and read what God said. Well, I've I read that scripture over and over. Well, read it again. 
because God can give you fresh revelation right out of the Word, something you've never seen before. Because God is a God that's more than enough. More than enough. Our, our, our ushers are coming, and we're going to receive communion. You know, Jesus said, as often we show, do the communion, we shall show forth his death till he come. One of these days, we're, we're going to receive the communion. We're going to be in heaven. Amen. We're going to be in heaven. Y'all miss a good place to shout. We're going to be in heaven. It's sooner than you think. Amen. There, there, there are a lot of folks. You know, we're going to be here one minute, and the next minute it's going to be standing in heaven. You're going to say, what happened? Because it's going to be a change. The Bible says in a moment in a twinkling eye, when the last trumpet sound, the dead in Christ will rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up to be with the Lord, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. We're going to be in the presence of the Most High God. And you, you're not going to worry about what's happening on earth. You're not going to worry about your, your flower garden or your grass or anything. You're not going to be worried about that. God is a God that is restored. And Jesus did, did this. Now, Paul wasn't present, but, but this is important, and, and the Lord taught him this. For I received of the Lord. He said, I received of Jesus Christ that which I also delivered unto you. That in the same night that the Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. Well, bread represents our life. Bread represents everything about our life. Bread is important. You know, Jesus said, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. The bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. To remember that the Lord Jesus Christ, everything he suffered, Everything that he suffered, he did it for us. The Bible says this, with his stripes, we are healed. I told you a few weeks ago, God healed me of prostate cancer. Why did he do that? Well, he's full of grace and mercy, but I tell you what, I did my part. I got in the Word. I confess healing scriptures every day of my life. If I missed, I, I doubled up. Why? Because God honors His Word. When you say what God says, God says what you say. God honors His Word. So, so He said, He took the bread and He broke it and He passed it out. Jesus, Jesus is teaching Paul this. He said, you wasn't here when I did this, but, but I took bread. Now, in the Jewish, they have unleavened breads, matzahs, you know, like a cracker. And, and Jesus broke that bread and gave it and said, Take, eat, this is my body. But after the same manner, he took the cup. I've taught you that he just didn't take any cup. In every place that they set out to receive a communion, they always set a place for the Messiah. Jesus took the cup that belonged to the Messiah and he filled it with the, with the fruit of the vine. And he said, take, this, this cup represents my blood that it was shed for the remission of your sins. And as often as you do it, you sh do show what my death accomplished. So when Jesus died, he, he accomplished something. He just didn't die, well, you know, like a lot of people, well, he was a mortar. no. Jesus died a mortar's death, but he had a purpose in dying. And if the devil had known what was going to happen, he would have never crucified. Lord, I mean, he'd, 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 you, demons, you, you make sure he doesn't hurt himself in any way. Keep him alive, because if he dies, I'm through with. Jesus said, this is my blood. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. If Jesus hadn't shed his blood, we'd be lost. We, there wouldn't be any hope. Because all that happened in the Old Testament, the tabernacle that Moses built, looked forward to Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. 
He told Eve, there is one I'm going to send. The devil looked for him. Cain killed Abel. He thought, yeah, he's, he may be the one. He's a good guy. God received his say, he must be it. You know, the devil's not as smart as he acts. He doesn't know a lot. Our God is, Jesus said, my father is greater than I am. Well, he's our fathers too. He's greater than the devil. Well, he created him. He's greater than the devil. The devil hadn't created anything. He just perverted everything that God created. Everything. You know, he, he, he perverts the hearts and minds of people. You know, little Eric, small and lovable. There's a day when she's going to be a teenager. And she'll have a mind of her own. And things will come out of her mouth that she, is that my child? We've experienced that, haven't we? My wife and I have experienced it. We think, who are you? You're not, you're not the little child that we drug around and did all that stuff for you. Because they get a mind of their own and the seed of sin takes over. And, uh, you know, the only thing that will change that is the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus will change us. When we, re- we, we support the men and women of Teen Challenge. And a lot of, a lot of especially women, because we have them come all the time. They come out of horrendous background. Just, you wouldn't want somebody to say, they need to testify, no, no, you don't want to know what they did. Because they did it to support the habit. But God changed their life. Paul was a vile person. You would not have liked Paul. Especially he said, I'm a Christian. He said, take them to jail. Take them to jail. Feed them to the lions. I don't care. Get rid of them. You wouldn't love those people. But because Jesus shed his blood. Let's, let's pray. Father, we thank you for the blood of Jesus and the body. Lord God, we thank you for the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says with his stripes we're healed. And we have faith that there's a day coming when we'll be raised from the dead, whether we go by the way of the grave or, Lord, we're alive and remain to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for his blood that was shed for the remission of our sin. Now we receive this with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Let us receive the, the bread together. And after the same manner of the cup. Hallelujah. And when you do that, you demonstrate that the devil is defeated. That God is exalted above all. That's the reason the Bible says Jesus is seated to the right hand of God wherever he lives to make intercession for us. Praise the Lord. God is good. Amen.